Garrett to join us today. Greg Garrett's a friend of mine, like I was saying before. We, um, when I worked at the American Cathedral in Paris, Greg is the um, theologian in residence at the American Cathedral. And so he was my downstairs neighbor usually in the summers. So you didn't have to bang on the top too much um, to get me to quiet down, hopefully. Um, but we are so excited to have you. Greg is the author of four novels, two memoirs, and 20 nonfiction works on faith, politics, race, culture, and narrative. And is, according to BBC Radio, one of America's essential voices on religion and culture. An award-winning professor of English at Baylor University, Greg also serves as theologian residence at the American Cathedral in Paris and is an elected member of the Texas this Institute of Letters. He lives in Austin, Texas with his wife Jeannie and their family. And then there's a link in the email this morning to his most recent book. So if you're interested, you can check that out. Oh, and thank you. Go ahead. Um, can we make Greg a co-host, Mary Byrne? Or I, did think, I think I am. Perfect. Um, so you guys are both co-hosts. You're all set. Great. So, thank you. Yes, so I have sharing privileges. And so I'm going to share something with you real quick. Um, I want to first uh, say thank you to Naomi and to the clergy at St. Luke's. It is such a joy to be with you. I've been talking to a lot of churches about this research um, because uh, 2020 is a year where a lot of people are recognizing some things about our culture um, that are really impossible not to recognize now. Uh, and uh, as I'm going to tell you, this is actually research that got its start in an Episcopal church and has been supported by the Episcopal church uh, all the way through it. So I'm super excited to share uh, this with you. Uh, so it is a, a joy to be with you. Uh, greetings from Austin, Texas. And uh, I bring some sort of greetings uh, from the American Cathedral in Paris, uh, our uh, cathedral in the European Convocation. And my invitation, and I'm sure Naomi's as well, to come and visit the American Cathedral when people can visit places again. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a joy to be with you this morning. Um, we've got a fairly limited amount of time, so I'm going to talk um, through some things pretty quickly uh, that normally I would uh, let develop uh, a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to be doing like greatest hits. This is a greatest hits album this morning uh, for adult formation for your forum. And uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about uh, three or four like um, particular things. I'd like to talk about why I wrote this most recent book about racism in American film. Um, I want to talk about how I wrote the book, because although I've written a lot of books, it's a very different process that I went through. And as I said, it was actually inspired uh, by my work in Episcopal churches. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the book itself, which looks at 100 years of American um, film, at racism, at representation, uh, and at different hopeful things that I think we can learn from some of these films about race and our culture. And um, that's kind of where I want to leave things today, and I want to leave some time for questions because I know that uh, some of you have expressed an interest in talking about this. Um, but the last chapter of the book is actually um, about what I learned uh, during this process and what I think we can learn uh, as a culture and as a nation. So um, this is the book. It's called A Long, Long Way, and the title comes uh, from something that Dr. King used to say when he was asked about the state of race relations in America. Um, he would always say, we have come a long, long way, and we have a long, long way to go. And uh, although he said this uh, 50 years ago, he's still saying it today. I mean, it's, it's uh, very much the situation where we find ourselves. And we've made an incredible amount of progress, and I'm going to talk about some of that progress in terms of Hollywood. Um, and then there are also things that we still need to do um, in terms of our uh, culture, in terms of um, our nation, and uh, in terms of our church. And so I, I hope that this will be of use to you, and I hope that this conversation will ripple out uh, from this morning and uh, that you'll continue to talk about some of these things. One of my favorite things about the public programs that I've been doing uh, on race and film over the last four years is sort of eavesdropping on people as they leave the venue. And I'm gonna show you some pictures from the National Cathedral in Washington, uh, where we put together a, uh, uh, an annual film festival called A Long, Long Way. And it's a, a festival of films about race and prejudice. And um, one of my favorite things to do is at the end of the evening, after we've watched a film and a panel has talked about it, to follow people down the hill from the cathedral to the Metro stop. 
and listen to them. And uh, all writers are eavesdroppers. It's one of our great gifts. Uh, if you're a really good writer, you probably have excellent eavesdropping skills. And I just love to listen to them continuing to talk about um, the movies that we've talked about, the issues that have been brought up. So um, that kind of leads us in the direction of why I wrote this book. Um, there are two really sort of um, seminal things that I wanna talk about. One is, well, they're both actually kind of personal, uh, but we're gonna talk about personal things, we're gonna talk about faith things, and we're gonna talk about vocational things. Um, because one of the questions that I've been asked over and over by the media about this book is, you're white. <laughs> you're a white, middle-aged, middle-class guy. And um, often when people write about racism in America, um, it's because they are writing out of their position as a person of color. Uh, it's because they are writing out of their experience and they're writing out of their pain and they're writing out of their feelings about how they've been treated over their lifetimes. And um, I think it's really important to address this quickly and immediately because one of the things that I think is essential, especially in 2020, is that white people have to be involved in the work of anti-racism and racial reconciliation. One of my partners in this research and, and one of my great friends that I've made over the last four years um, is the great African-American Episcopal theologian, Kelly Brown Douglas. Uh, Kelly is the canon theologian at Washington National Cathedral. Um, she is the theologian in, in residence at uh, Trinity Church Wall Street, which is a pretty sweet gig. Um, and she is also the uh, Dean of our Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, she is one of the foremost voices of African-American theology in this country. And um, she said something to me recently that pushed back against a lot of expectations and understandings that I had. And that is something that Kelly does with some facility. Uh, she does it with love and she does it with fierceness. And um, she had said something to me in an email um, about how she did not need me to be her ally. And I've noticed in 2020, I see a lot of ally language, especially around the Black Lives Matter marches. And um, so I asked her to clarify that. And as I said, in her fierce, intelligent, honest, and loving way, this is what she said to me. She said, Greg, when you say that you wanna be my ally, what that implies is that racism is our problem. People who look like me, it is our problem. White supremacy and racism is your problem. We didn't create the system you did. And we need you to do the work of helping to dismantle it. And that, that hit me right here, as I'm sure she knew that it would. And so one of the things that has really come out of the, I don't know, this is probably the 50th time I've talked about this book in the last few months, uh, to media, to churches. But one of the essential things, if you don't hear anything else today, I hope that you will hear this. It is all of our responsibilities to push back against racism. And one of the things that I've learned in the writing of this book and in all the conversations that I had, um, when I wrote this book, I thought I was writing primarily about individual racism. And the more I leaned into it and the more conversations I had with people of color, the more I realized that what we were really talking about is systemic racism, institutional racism in the church, in the country, um, in our laws, in our zoning, in all of these ways that for 401 years, white people, people who look just like me, have used their power and authority to maintain themselves at the top of the pyramid. And um, so that is the surprising thing about why I wrote the book. I thought I was writing it about racism, but it turned out that I was writing about a whole lot of things that I didn't understand so well when I started writing it. So the things that I wanna say about why I initially took on this project, I was raised in the deep South and I started school in Atlanta, Georgia and Charlotte, North Carolina in recently desegregated schools. And, um, so that ages me. I mean, you can sort of tell how old I am because of that, and I'm fine with that. Um, I was uh, saying earlier to Naomi, this is my birthday week, and you know, I'm celebrating another year of crawling around the globe. When I grew up in the Deep South, I noticed 
that my white teachers sometimes treated my black classmates differently than they treated me. And if you have noticed this in children, grandchildren, you know that there is this innate sense of fairness and justice that is built into our kids. They may not be able to articulate a theological or philosophical reason for it, but they understand what unfairness looks like. And so one of my earliest memories is of racial injustice, of the unfairness that my friends were treated differently than me because they looked differently than me. I've never forgotten that, I've never shaken it. It's one of the formative things in my life and I'm sure some of you could tell similar stories. And then the second thing about why I wrote this book is a little bit complicated, but again, we're doing greatest hits, so I'll make it as quick as I can. Um, for much of my adult life, I suffered from chronic serious depression. And early in this millennium, it was life-threatening. I did not expect to survive it. And one day I wandered in and sat down in a pew in the back of St. James Episcopal Church, the historically African-American church in East Austin, Texas. And they welcomed me. They loved me, they patched me up and they sent me back out to patch up other people. And so I was, after growing up in a very conservative evangelical Christian tradition, which was very damaging to me, I was rescued by these people who saw that this peace and justice work was an essential part of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. I was trained by people who had seen injustice. Um, this church, of course, was formed in East Austin because um, Black Episcopalians in Austin could not attend white Episcopal churches. And the simple fact that they welcomed me and loved me and um, thought enough of me to say, you have got something to say to the world. Um, they sent me off to seminary uh, where I trained to be an Episcopal priest. And thanks be to God, I didn't become one um, because I would have been a really terrible priest and I'm a really good writer. So, um, it is lovely that the church helps us discern these things. So I've got the early memories and then I've got the later memories, uh, which are a huge part of why I wrote this book. And then the last thing is that I promised to tell you um, a little bit about how this book got its start in the Episcopal church. Um, not so far away from you, in an inner city church in Wilmington, Delaware, um, the Reverend David Andrews invited me to come and speak and to do a Lenten retreat for his uh, church in inner city Wilmington. Uh, his church is a really interesting church. It's Saints Andrew and Matthew. And it is a church that was formed from a white congregation and a black congregation who were put together by their bishop. And he said, you know, I've been here for 10 years and we worship together and we work together, but we have never had the hard conversations about identity, about difference, and it was actually David Andrews' idea. He said, I want you to come and I want you to show us some movies about racism, about race and prejudice. I want you to lead us in conversation. And I think that that will allow us to deep dive into some of the things that we have not been able to talk about profitably. And it was a brilliant idea. Uh, I've been teaching at Baylor University for 31 years now. And in my literature classes, that is an item of belief for me. Great books, great films, allow us to talk about the most important things about what it means to be human, about our differences, and also about the ways in which we are absolutely the same. And so I said, yes, absolutely. I wanna come and do this. And so I showed three films uh, that weekend, all three of which I actually end up devoting a chapter to in the book. Uh, one was uh, the 1967 film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Uh, with Sidney Poitier. Uh, one was um, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, uh, 31 years old now and still as relevant as the moment it was made. And uh, one was the early 2000s movie Crash, uh, which is this sort of essential post 9-1-11 parable uh, about racism and prejudice. And we watched, guess who's coming to dinner on the Friday night of our weekend retreat. And we had an amazing conversation after it. All of these people in the room, I mean, incredibly diverse, but the movie and the characters and their stories gave them a starting point for a conversation about race and identity. 
that would have been very different if we'd started in our kind of entrenched positions. When we talk about a movie or about a story, we're not talking about ourselves. And we're not even actually talking about our own opinions or beliefs. It's, it's the difference between talking about a movie and what happens at some of our Thanksgiving tables in a good year where we've got all of these people with a bunch of different viewpoints. And in my house, there are like four things we're not allowed to talk about. So, um, you know, basically politics, race, religion, and sex are supposed to be off limits at my house because nobody in my family can agree about any of them. Those are all four things that I talked about in this book. But by talking about them through the context of these films, it's possible to have a really engaging conversation that takes people out of their entrenched positions. And when we look at the characters in these films and the ethical decisions they make, the mistakes they make, there is an incredible grace that we're granted uh, to live these other lives and to learn from them. So I am always grateful uh, to David Andrews who started this experiment. Uh, I'm grateful to Kelly Brown Douglas who has done so many of these programs with me. I'm grateful to uh, the many churches and other institutions that have asked me to come and talk about this. And so that kind of leads us in the direction of how I wrote the book. And I'm gonna share um, a couple of pictures with you real quick or attempt to anyway. Um, all right, so what I'm showing you right now are some shots from Washington National Cathedral. Did those come up for you all? Are you seeing something? Yes? Beautiful. Okay, so uh, the black and white picture is a picture of the jam-packed nave of Washington National Cathedral. Uh, this is a group of people who are here to watch Spike Lee's movie, Black Klansman, and to participate in the uh, conversation about it afterward. Uh, over on your right-hand side, and I'll just pull this over because um, it, for me and probably for some of you, it is uh, hidden behind some of our gallery pictures. And uh, what I've tried to do in all of these programs is to make sure that we either have conversation among the people who have watched the films or a higher level conversation uh, in a place where, like if there are 800 people in the nave, uh, you can listen to some people talking. Um, and uh, let me point out just a couple of people. Uh, I am the white guy over on the left there. <laughs> Uh, right here in the middle is my friend Kelly Brown Douglas. Um, there is Corva Coleman from NPR who usually moderates these programs for us at the National Cathedral. And um, so the thing that was really very different um, about this book, I was in uh, college and grad school a working journalist and I did entertainment, I did sports, I did a little bit of hard news and I leaned very hard back into doing interviews and to other people's voices. Um, when I started writing this book and when I proposed it to my editor at Oxford University Press, I did it out of the knowledge that I'm really good at reading texts. That's something that I do as a writer, teacher, preacher. Um, you know, it's, it's a skill that I have. But one of the things that I realized very quickly, especially in my conversations with Kelly, was that my perspective was so radically limited. Limited, excuse me. Um, in seminary, we learned about a concept called hermeneutic filters, that we interpret texts, including the Bible, based on our own experience. And so when I watched these films, as liberal as I tried to be, as expansive as I tried to be in my readings, I was still reading them as somebody who looked and lived and thought like myself. And so one of the great experiences that I had during the course of the three and some years that I spent writing the book was talking to people who didn't look like me about their experiences. And some of those things were bracing. Some of them were heartbreaking. Um, and I'm gonna tell you one of these stories and there are lots more in the book, but um, one of the people that I've done a bunch of these programs with is a writer for the Atlantic Monthly named Van Newkirk. And uh, it's V-A-N-N. New Kirk, Kirk, like the Scottish church. Um, I think that Van is our James Baldwin. Uh, I don't know of anybody in America who is writing about race and politics better than Van Newkirk in the Atlantic Monthly. And um, so I have listened to him and I have learned from him and he and I have become friends. But I have also 
recognized how different our experiences are, even though we are very similar in what we do. He writes, he speaks, he does public programs. Um, but because his skin color and my skin color are different, our ways of looking at the world are absolutely different. And so here's, here's the story that I wanna tell. We did a program at Washington National Cathedral uh, where we screened Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Um, and that's a film that was made in 1989. And as I was saying earlier, it is still incredibly current. I wish that it weren't, uh, but it's a film about uh, violence against black bodies. Uh, it's a film about prejudice, racism, misrepresentation. Um, it's a, a film about how hard it is for us to live together. And uh, so we had watched this film, which brings me to tears every time I see it. I've been teaching it for 30 years. I've shown it over and over in public programs. Uh, I'm still rocked by it every time I see it. Um, it is not just a great film by a black filmmaker. It's one of the greatest films in American film history. And so I took a deep breath and I joined Van on stage. And I'd shown you Corva Coleman. And uh, because Corva is not just a great journalist, but a great interviewer, she knew that when we started our conversation, she needed to start with me. And usually in these, I like to go last. I like to hear everybody else. But she wanted to talk about my experience with law enforcement. As the one white face on the stage, she wanted to talk about my experience with law enforcement. And my wife, Jeannie, likes for me to be clear. I have never been convicted of a crime. But in my teenage years, I lived, uh, we moved back to my family's home state, Oklahoma. And we lived in a very small town where I got in all kinds of trouble. And the really interesting thing about that, especially reflecting on this in front of a huge audience sitting in Washington National Cathedral, is there was never a single time when I got pulled over by one of our police officers, one of our two police officers, when I feared for my life. I sometimes feared for the beer that was hiding in my trunk because they would make me open my trunk and pour it out on the side of the road. I sometimes feared that they would call my mom because they did. I never for a moment, any of the times that I had encounters with law enforcement as a young man was afraid for my safety. And Kelly Brown Douglas and I had talked about the talk and in my house, the talk was about the birds and the bees. And in Kelly's house, the talk was about how her son could survive an encounter with law enforcement. So I finished my talk and I am having all these realizations. And then Corva Coleman turns to Van Newkirk who is sitting next to me on the stage. And she says, Van, could you tell us about your experience with law enforcement? And Van put his hands out in front of him on an, in an imaginary steering wheel. And Corva said, Van, could you explain to our audience what you're doing? And Van Newkirk, whose brain is a national treasure that belongs in the Smithsonian, who is one of the smartest and kindest and most genuine people that I know, turned to Corva and he said, I am putting my hands in plain view on the steering wheel so that I don't get killed. And in that moment, as I'm seeing on some of your faces, like things just crashed over me in terms of my own experience and Van's experience. And it became clear to me that I needed to listen to a whole lot of voices that were not my voice that it would have been easy for me to write a book from my perspective, what I think about racism in film, but it would have been so incredibly limited. And so this thing about how I wrote the book, this was a collaborative book. And even though nobody else's name is on it, every time I talk about it and everywhere in the text, you will find Van and Kelly Brown Douglas and Corva and a number of uh, black theologians and writers, including the great James Baldwin. Uh, who was my guide uh, during the entire time I was writing this. This was a book that relied on my learning things from other people. And that is always true when you write a nonfiction book, but it has never been this true before. 
I felt like I had some ideas about how to write this book and the book that resulted is so different, so much deeper, so much better than the book that I had originally intended. So um, I'm gonna share a screen again real quick because I said that I would say a little bit about the book itself and I wanna kind of walk you through it. Um, yeah, let's do that. And let me take some of these down. Uh, so what I think, if I've done this correctly, you are seeing is two movie posters. Is that good? We just one. one. Okay. All right. Uh, which one is it? Birth of a Nation. Okay, that's fine. We can start with that. Um, this is a book that covers 100 years of Hollywood history, and it works through some of the different phases that Hollywood and our nation have taken. Um, I treat film as one of our most representative forms of culture. And uh, one of the things that I do when I write about culture is I try and interrogate it for meaning. And um, so when we start with D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, as the book does, we are starting with the first major feature film. We are starting with a film that was incredibly popular, culturally current, uh, incredibly well reviewed, and also incredibly controversial. Um, this is the film that recreated the modern Ku Klux Klan. It's a film that was responsible for uh, an incredible rise in um, racial activism and um, membership in the NAACP. And um, the reason that I start with this book, with this in the book is that uh, Birth of a Nation is in some ways our ground zero for American racism. And I wish that I could say we could just ignore it and pretend that it doesn't matter. But one of the points that I make very early in the book is that the white supremacists marching in Charlottesville a couple of years ago are saying exactly the same things that are expressed in Birth of a Nation. There is a through line from Birth of a Nation to white supremacy in 2020. And to ignore Birth of a Nation is to ignore our history. It's to turn our back on all of these things that are still fermenting in our, our society. And um, so there are a couple of things about Birth of a Nation that I'll share with you before um, we move forward. But one of the things that I think is really important James Baldwin, when he saw this film, said that it is an incredible work of cinematic art and an incitement to genocide. And we have to hold both of those things in our head at the same time, because if the movie were not so artistically successful, its ardent racism wouldn't matter so much. But in a movie like this or in a movie like Gone with the Wind, which I know some of you may have watched in preparation for this morning, there are so many lost cause narratives that are being explored and extolled. And they are extolled successfully. I watched Gone with the Wind uh, again uh, earlier this summer, right after HBO had taken it off and then put it back on with some, um, some orienting commentary. And it's an incredibly successful movie. Uh, you're touched, you're moved, it makes you angry. Um, every time that stupid Terra theme starts to play, you just sort of sigh. Oh. And again, the two elements of that, the racism and the artistry, go together in a lot of these Hollywood films. And so one of the things that I found really important in the book was to hold these harmful mythologies up to the light where I found them, and also to celebrate the things worth celebrating uh, so that we could learn something from it, so we could um, recognize that, it's, uh, that there is progress. We have come a long, long way. Um, so the second thing that I want to show you, and this is our, our far end, uh, I hope that what just came up for you is the Black Klansman poster. Can you see that? No? Okay. Hang on. Let's see what we got. Let me try that again. Yep. Okay. So you will, of course, notice some obvious similarities to the classic Birth of a Nation poster. Uh, this is the Spike Lee film, Black Klansman, which I talk about uh, early in the book. And it represents the far end of what we wanna talk about in terms of race and film in America. Uh, not only is it a film starring a person of color, made by, written by people of color, um, but it is a film that actually turns um, upside down some of the Hollywood story, uh, 
tropes and conventions. And uh, the film that I talk about in some detail in this phase is uh, Jordan Peele's movie, Get Out, which I'll talk with you about in just a second. But I do wanna celebrate some of the other things um, that have happened along the way from this horrible beginning, Birth of a Nation. Uh, Henry Louis Gates talks about Birth of a Nation as kind of the distillation of the redemption period after reconstruction. Uh, in his latest book, Gates says that Birth of a Nation recaptures everything that white people tried to do. Slavery was gone, but they found a number of ways to force black people back into servitude. Um, so we think of this, of course, as Jim Crow now. But Birth of a Nation is our starting place. Um, it's ardently racist. It's appalling in a lot of ways. Um, one of the most terrible things about it is that um, the black villains in the film are not even played by black people. Uh, they're played by white people in blackface. And yeah, I don't even know what to say about that. Um, so this is our starting point. And for decades after this, we find a lot of ardent racism in Hollywood films, or we find no representation at all, which is in its own way, a terrible thing. Uh, Barry Jenkins, who directed Moonlight and If Beale Street Could Talk, said, if you don't see yourself on the screen, it's as if you don't exist. And one of my first formative conversations with Kelly Brown Douglas was about the first time that she saw Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. She said she had never in her life gone to a movie and seen a black person in a major role. She said to look at Sidney Poitier, she was seeing the strong, intelligent black men that she knew. It was a confirmation for her. And for people who look like me, I have seen myself confirmed on television and on movie screens my entire life. There was never a moment when I didn't feel like I didn't exist because most of the people that I was watching looked like me. But for Kelly, it was this incredible moment. And so there are a couple of phases that I wanna talk about that I address in chapters in the book. Um, some of you, uh, as we said, may have watched Gone with the Wind in preparation for this. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen it at some point in your lives. Uh, but I talk about a period in the 30s and 40s where uh, people of color are given minor roles that partake of some actual humanity. And uh, so um, Hattie McDaniel, of course, won the Academy Award for playing Mammy in Gone with the Wind. And then I write at uh, some length about uh, the character of Sam, played by Dooley Wilson in Casablanca. These are small roles, they're supporting roles, but they are characters with some strength and some dignity and the actors portraying them give them a life outside of the stereotypes. And so this is a phase after Birth of a Nation that's really important to recognize and to celebrate. Um, many African-American film critics, for example, watching Casablanca said that there has never been a character like Sam before a character who resembles us, who is not a stereotype, a step and fetch it, a mammy, but a character who, who has an intelligence and an inner life. And one of the things that I love about the character of Mammy and that I love about Sam in Casablanca is that they stand up to the main characters in their films. There is some strength to them. And um, there are a couple of major gestures in Casablanca um, one of which that I talk about in the book is really sort of radical for its time frame. Some of you will remember that there's a flashback to Paris and Naomi and I were talking about Paris earlier uh, where we met. Um, so in uh, the middle of the film, there's the flashback to uh, Rick and Ilse's relationship in Paris. And Sam is an essential part of that as well. And as the Nazis come into town, you may remember that there's a scene in uh, the bistro, La Belle Aurore where they are trying to drink a bunch of champagne before the Nazis get there. And there is a toast. And Elsa and Rick toast each other, Sam toasts them, and they toast Sam. And just in terms of racial code um, for film, this is an incredible recognition of him. It seems like such a minor thing to us. But when Ingrid Bergman recognizes Sam's humanity and toasts him back, it is one of the really powerful things that happens in uh, the golden age of Hollywood in terms of race. So then if we jump ahead with the other phases, uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is part of this um, 
I call it the Poitier Renaissance. In the 50s and 60s, Sidney Poitier was in so many major films. And in fact, in 1966 and 1967, he was in three box office champions. And he was the 1967 box office champ. He was the most popular uh, actor in the world in that year. And uh, there are two films that he made that year, In the Heat of the Night um, and uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, both of which have some really important steps forward. In the book, I talk about Guess Who's Coming to Dinner because one of the ongoing myths that is expressed in Hollywood and in American culture is about the sexuality of black men and about miscegenation. Uh, Birth of a Nation is really worried about racial mixing. And uh, so Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, as those of you who have seen it know, is a, about um, Sidney Poitier coming home to meet the parents of his white girlfriend. And they want uh, the parents' approval. Uh, Spencer Tracy is the father, and he has to decide if he's going to grant his approval. And it's um, just the simple fact of the relationship is a big deal, even though it doesn't seem like it to us in 2020. Uh, in 1967, when the movie was being produced, there were anti-miscegenation laws in one third of American states. Uh, the Loving case in the Supreme Court actually came down after the film had completed filming, after Spencer Tracy died. And so during the time that they were making this film, in a third of American states, it was illegal for a black man to marry a white woman. That's pretty radical. And some of you may actually remember this as well. One of the members of LBJ's cabinet, uh, his daughter, his white daughter was going to marry a black man. Uh, I think he was an astrophysicist at NASA. And um, this cabinet member offered LBJ his resignation because he said he didn't want to bring shame on the administration. And Time Magazine actually covered that wedding. It was a cover story for Time Magazine in late 1967. So this was an incredibly topical thing that they were making a movie about in 1967. And even though it doesn't seem such a big deal to us now, it continues to be something that resonates. Um, the next steps, and I'll run through these very quickly. We've got bad representation and prejudice or misrepresentation or no representation. We've got minor roles for people of color. We've got major roles for people of color. And then we've got people of color making their own movies, starring in them, uh, working as crew on them. Uh, the two major figures for this are Spike Lee and John Singleton. And uh, I've talked already about Do the Right Thing and how powerful it is. And uh, I showed you the poster from Black Klansman, which came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and Spike actually has a current film on uh, Netflix, uh, Defy Bloods, which is really powerful and moving. Um, and then we move from there, the last two phases that I talk about, and I'll mention these quickly, and then we'll, um, I think, move in the direction of what I've learned and some of your questions. Um, I talk in the book about what I call casual multiculturalism. It used to be a victory for people of color if there was a single person of color in a film. But in recent years, some of you know that there has been a, a social media movement about the Oscars called Oscars So White. And a couple of years ago, there was a, an Oscar ceremony where only one person of color was nominated for a major category. Uh, the Mexican-American director uh, in a retu, I think. Uh, no, no actors, no, um, no uh, writers, I mean, and um, that was in some ways an aberration because if you look at many of our blockbusters now, there is what I call this casual multiculturalism. If you watch an Avengers film, um, if you watch a lot of the sort of franchise or what they call tentpole films, you'll see that they're incredibly multicultural. And one of the reasons for this is economic because Hollywood relies on global income now and not just making movies for white Americans. Uh, but part of it's also this recognition that we should make movies that look more like our culture. And in some places we even have this interesting and beautiful kind of counter casting uh, like Lin-Manuel Miranda does in Hamilton where we have a bunch of figures from American history played by people who look like America now. So we've got a black George Washington. And um, so the film that I chose for this is the early 2000s film Crash, 
it's a powerful film. Um, it's controversial because there were a lot of critics who don't like it. And just from a critical point of view, if you choose to watch it, let me tell you that what you should not do is ask it for realism. Um, it is one of those films with a whole bunch of characters whose lives keep interacting. They keep running into each other. And the literary analogy that I draw is to Dickens. Um, if you read a Dickens novel, you would not know that there were a million people in London. It's just the same six people who keep running into each other over and over again. And so you have to park your disbelief about the coincidence and recognize that this is a literary convention that goes back years and years and years. And in fact, the, the great movie critic Roger Ebert of Blessed Memory uh, wrote an incredible review of it that I commend to you. He called it the, the, the film of the year, the year that he came out. And he said, this is not a realistic film, it's a parable. And that struck home for me, you know, as somebody who preaches parables quite a bit. Um, it is, it's a movie that's intended to teach us something. And if we can embrace it in that way and not uh, ask it for realism, then it can do that work in a really powerful sense. And then the last film that I talk about in the book is the movie Get Out. And um, I'm gonna tell a story or two about this because um, I think this kind of encapsulates what the book has been trying to do and what I learned in the process of writing it and putting on all of these public programs. Um, Get Out is a retelling of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Uh, I would call it a social horror story. And I put off watching it for a long time because I'm guessing that everybody who's watching right now is like over the age of 17. Um, I watched a lot of horror films when I was 17, but I have realized since that life is plenty dramatic and plenty scary. Uh, and I don't need to watch a horror film or get on the world's biggest roller coaster. I just need to kind of get up in the morning and pay my bills and make sure the girls get off to, well, online school. So I put off watching it for a long time. And my son, uh, Chandler, who's 23 now, said, uh, Dad, aren't you supposed to talk about this at Washington National Cathedral next week? And I'm like, yeah. I said, maybe you should watch it. Okay, that's a good idea. You should always watch something before you're supposed to talk about it. And um, so I watched it and it was this incredibly powerful experience and not nearly as gory as I was afraid. And I knew immediately that I needed to watch it again. Like we sat down, we watched it twice right in a row. So uh, at another program, I showed it uh, in downtown Houston, Texas. And uh, this was something that we opened to the larger Houston community, although it was um, kind of headquartered at the Episcopal Cathedral in downtown Houston. And before the movie, before we showed Get Out at the end of our weekend, um, a woman came up to me and she was an older woman. And uh, she said, I can't watch it. I've never watched a horror movie in my life. And I said, I understand that. Uh, I, I felt the same way that you do. And if you can't watch it, I understand. I feel like there's a lot you could learn from it. Um, but you know, you, you make that choice. You can be the best um, you know, uh, person to decide. And so she decided to watch it. And like many of us who don't necessarily like horror films, she watched it like this, right? So you know, through her fingers, and when it was over, I was talking with a, a black pastor and he was my conversation partner for that weekend. And uh, so Sean and I were up on stage talking about how this is a movie you have to watch more than once. Uh, it's full of so much dramatic irony. There's so many things you understand after seeing it that you didn't understand when you were first watching it. And um, this lovely woman was on the front row right in front of Sean and I, and she was just shaking her head violently at this idea that she should have to watch the movie again. And in fact, at one point, I, I remember she was mouthing up to me, no, no, I can't do it. And then after it was all over, she came up to me and she said, I don't want to see this movie again, but I'm going to. Because I live in a racist society and I want to understand how to change that. And I was touched by that. I was moved by that because I understood exactly where she was coming from. Uh, but the punchline of the story is this. Somebody from the peace and justice community at Houston's Cathedral came over to me afterward and she said, do you know who that is? And I said, no. And it turns out like she was a mover and shaker in Houston society, had been involved with the peace and justice work of the cathedral for many, many years. Uh, and then this woman says to me, and it's just amazing that she showed up at all this weekend because she's a hundred years old. <laughs> and I said, what? She said, she's a hundred years old. And that puts so many things in relief for me. I mean, it's birth of a nation to get out. Like her life spanned that whole history. 
of our treatment of race. And I was touched by her courage. And I tell this story about her almost every time I talk about the book because I was so inspired by her. The other story that I wanna tell though is with, about a much younger woman, but it's also a story about what we can learn from these movies and about the, the power that story has as a transformative thing for us. I mean, there's a reason that Jesus teaches in stories. You know, he could have taught us something about what it means to be a good neighbor, or he could have told us a story about somebody who was set upon by thieves and left to die by the side of a road. And you know which of those he chose. So story is one of the most powerful transformational things that we have. The reason that I tell that story about me and Van Newkirk is because I have had plenty of white people who say, I don't believe in white privilege. I've had to work hard for everything that I've gotten. And I'm like, yeah, I understand that. But let me tell you the story about my friend Van and see if that shakes anything loose for you. So we were watching Get Out, which as we said, is this remake of the story of a white woman bringing her black boyfriend home to meet the parents. Now, and guess who's coming to dinner? It's a drawing room comedy. <laughs> and Get Out, it's like, what are some of the terrible things that could happen to a black man coming home to visit a white family? And um, it is a movie that is full of aggressions and microaggressions, uh, a, a film full of cringeworthy moments that the director, Jordan Peele, invites us to share because the young black man, Chris, is the point of view character for all of us in the audience. We are invited to share his experience in the movie and to see through his eyes. And so there was a young woman from Baylor. I usually bring students to the National Cathedral for the big uh, film festival that we put on there. And uh, she was a particular kind of Baylor student, uh, wealthy, blonde. Most of the difficulties in her life have been cushioned for her. And, and I say this not to denigrate her in any way. I love her dearly. She's an incredibly smart and strong woman. Um, but there are certain things that she's been shielded from because of her privilege. And uh, so we were watching Get Out together and she was sitting next to me in the nave of the cathedral. And when the movie was over, she turned to me and she was weeping. I mean, just straight out mascara, you know, streaming, weeping. And she said, I never before understood what white people do to black people. Now I know. And I thought that's it. That's exactly what these stories can do for us. Once we see something, we cannot unsee it. The reason I'm talking to so many churches in 2020 is because so many of us have seen the video of George Floyd and we cannot unsee it. And so what I commend to you, whether or not you ever read my book or not, is the idea of using story, film, other stories that are available to us in the culture. And I'm sure that you already do this in forum and other places in the life of your community. But these are stories that can be transformational. They can shake us up. We can have light bulb over our head moments. They can change us because of what we learn from them and what we feel as we experience them. And as I said to you, every time I see Do the Right Thing, which I've probably shown 60 times now, I am shaken by it and I am, I am refixed in my determination to make some kind of difference. And, and that is what film can do for it, us, especially when we pair it with the teachings of our faith. So we've got about 10, uh, six, five, five minutes left. Actually, our, we are a little over, aren't we? Yeah, we're, Naomi? Good. we're good. We're good. Keep going. Keep oh, I'm so sorry. Working. Okay, let me let me offer the chance for a couple of questions. I was thrown off by our time difference. <laughs> and I was like, oh, there's plenty of time. Even though I wrote down, I wrote down 12 o'clock. So I am so sorry. Um, is there a question or a comment? Um, about race and film, about uh, racism in American culture at this moment. Um, anything that you would like to address before we leave? And again, I'm so sorry. Um, I wrote this down and I was paying attention to my clock and not our time. Oh, Jennifer, thank you. Um, anybody else? 
questions, comments? Yes, Martha, I see your hand. Yeah. Do you want me to ask it now? Please. Yeah. Um, I one of, one of the films that I liked, I actually liked the book better, but was The Color Purple, which was a film, you know, from the perspective of a, of a Black person, and it was all about Black life. Does that have any place in your pantheon of understanding one another? Yeah, I think it's, it's a, and with you, I, I agree that the novel is much more powerful than the film. Um, but one of the things that's been really interesting, especially as I've talked to largely white churches and dioceses, um, I told Naomi this, I'm actually going to be going to the Diocese of East Tennessee from the corner of my bedroom in the next few weeks. And uh, the Bishop of East Tennessee invited me. He's like, all I have are white people in my churches. We need to learn about black lives. And, and Martha, your question is basically, is this a good representation? And it absolutely is. So great novels you know, um, ab about black lives, great films about black lives, great television shows about black lives. Um, can help us understand uh, the experiences and the differences and the injustices in a much more powerful and profound way. Um, and, and this is happening, I think, a lot this year. Um, one of the shows that my wife Jeannie and I watch is This Is Us, uh, which is this you know, sort of powerful family melodrama. And uh, they premiered their new season this week and a huge part of it uh, was about the Black Lives Matter movement and about the differences um, between a, a black sibling and his white siblings as they address this issue. So I, I think one of the things that we can do with a book or a film like The Color Purple is we can learn from it, we can be inspired by it. Um, so I, I think that that's one of the things, I mean, I'm, thank you so much for bringing that up. That is a, a great recommendation for us. Um, anybody else, a question or a comment before we, we uh, finish up here? And again, I'm so grateful to you all for being here. This is, it's a hard conversation, but it's so necessary. All right, um, well, let's close with prayer. If we could, it feels to me like we should close everything in 2020 with prayer. Um, so again, uh, Naomi and uh, Derek and the clergy, uh, thank you so much for including me in this. I hope that this will be part of a, a larger conversation that continues uh, to ripple out from, from your community. Um, and uh, so grateful for the chance to talk with you about it. Let us pray. Holy One, Walk with us through this week. Make us instruments of your peace. Make us agents of your justice. We pray all this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. One God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Take good care. Stay Thank safe. You. Thank you. Thank, all. you. Thank you so much for joining us. It was good to see you. Good to see you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.